Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Making the Most of Your Mouse Model with Bead-Based Multiplexing. I'm Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by LabRoots and sponsored by Luminex. For more information on our sponsor, please visit luminexcorp.com. Now let's get started. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window, or report your problem by clicking on the Answer a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I'd like to now introduce our presenter, Dr. Daniel Braunschweig, Proteomics Field Application Scientist Leader at BioRad Laboratories. Dr. Daniel Braunschweig received his PhD in immunology from the University of California, Davis, studying the role of the immune system in autism. He subsequently published more than 15 peer-reviewed articles on the interface between neurodevelopment and immunology with an emphasis on emerging immunoassay techniques. Dr. Braunschweig has held a variety of positions in the biotechnology field and currently leads a team of field application scientists focused on assisting researchers with protein purification and immunoassays. For a complete biography on Dr. Braunschweig, please visit the Biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Braunschweig, you may now begin your presentation. Well, thank you very much, Judy. We'll get started now discussing bead-based multiplexing technology using mouse models. So the agenda for today is to discuss different uses for mouse models and where they're most relevant, uh, some insights that can be gained from their use, as well as limitations that uh, people should be aware of when using mouse models, and we'll discuss the XMAP platform uh, for use in mouse models uh, of various diseases. When planning experiments, there are a variety of considerations that are quite important. When using mouse models, we'll take a look at some of those, and we'll finish by looking at some of the attributes of assays that will make them optimal for mouse experiments. So here we go. Now, before we get started, I want to frame this conversation in the context of Koch's postulates. These are basically the, uh, the criteria that were established quite a while ago to identify the causative agents in disease. These are widely known and, you know, ultimately for microorganisms that cause disease, they should be found in a diseased organism. They should be able to be isolated. And then those microorganisms, when cultured, could introduce the disease into an otherwise healthy organism and then later be re-isolated as well. And broadly speaking, these postulates are true, although over time, numerous exceptions to these postulates have arisen. And I think this is a good perspective to take when considering the use of mouse models in biomedical research, because in many regards, they do represent disease states well uh, as they apply to humans, but there are many exceptions to that. And it's those exceptions that are really critical to be cognizant of when selecting the appropriate mouse model as well as the appropriate tools for analyzing that model. So moving forward, mouse models are very widely used. Essentially, all pharmaceutical development relies heavily on mouse models during R&D stages. Uh, particularly, uh, an emerging area in pharmaceutical research uh, are immunotherapies and, and cell and gene therapies, where uh, rather than having a drug that directly uh, kills a, micro, a disease causing microorganism or cures a disease, there's a lot of effort underway now to modulate the human immune system in a way that it can actually effectively clear a disease or to uh, change using uh, gene manipulation to change cells of the host individual to be better be able to uh, address disease. So there are a lot of immunodeficient mice that are used in this case for hosting human cells or human tissues to uh, identify cures for these diseases. And this is uh, this is a major area of mouse model use currently. And importantly, 
uh, basically in support of the fact that essentially all pharmaceuticals are developed these days using mouse models. Uh, this is a rapidly growing industry and currently represents uh, approximately $2 billion uh, spent annually only on the mouse models and their analysis in pharmaceutical R&D. It's a quite a large business and it is growing. And this, of course, is not to mention the extensive use of mouse models in academic research uh, with the goal of just characterizing disease states. Now, mouse models bring with them many um, pros and cons. Um, so there are many insights that can be gained from using them. So we'll take a look at a few of those. Um, certainly in the context of diseases that are either caused by or exacerbated by certain genetic conditions, uh, knockout strains of mice are easily, uh, relatively easily created and widely available these days from commercial sources. So this way, individual genes can be analyzed for their impact on a disease state. In general, during uh, pharmaceutical development in R&D, mouse model data is used by, uh, by pharmaceutical companies who are submitting to the FDA and is accepted generally by them when used appropriately. Fortunately, a lot of development has uh, been made in the area of assays for determining the response of a mouse model to a, very, to a disease state or a treatment. And so there's a, a quite a, a wide range of assay content available to interrogate mouse models. On the other hand, there are some limitations that are really important to, to keep in mind as you develop a mouse model for your work. Uh, in some cases, the disease state or the progression of the disease can be unclear in the mouse model. And this is particularly true in the early stages of a disease. And that's oftentimes a point where uh, it is very important to understand the beginning of the disease and, uh, and thus be able to measure accurately the early stages of, of the disease. And there are also a lot of ways that people approach uh, the experimental design using mouse models and different ways that the data are interpreted. And it's quite important to maintain consistency with this in order for the data to be useful. And of course, there are numerous strains of mice and um, we'll see later in this presentation that the impact of the age of the mouse or the tissue that's used can be quite significant in the results that one gets when looking for various uh, immune factors in these mice. And the last thing is that the development of a mouse doesn't perfectly par parallel that of humans. And this is particularly uh, true when you're looking at uh, developmental dis disorders. Uh, that the stages of development are not exactly the same. And so it's important to keep that in mind when looking at the impact of the mouse model, uh, the impact of the disease on the mouse model. Now, of course, the biggest con and one of the biggest challenges that researchers face when using mouse models is their small size, which greatly limits the available sample from each mouse. So based on that, looking at the small size of this mouse, let's take a look at what actually is available from a mouse model. So, an adult mouse has approximately 1.5 milliliters of whole blood. And from that, uh, one can derive approximately 500 microliters of serum for use in, in um, assays. For genotyping a mouse to determine, uh, to determine the genotype or to mark the mouse uh, for, for future work, there's approximately two to three millimeters of an ear punch that can be taken or uh, the tip of a tail for that work. Uh, the brain of a mouse is approximately one gram. So when you start to look at individual brain regions, it can be difficult to do those dissections and to derive sufficient tissue for all the analysis that's necessary. And in general, when you look at the rest of the tissues of the mouse, you're looking at milligram quantities of lymph nodes or spleen, heart, liver, et cetera. So as people need to understand the impacts of treatments on their disease, for example, and look at uh, liver toxicity, which is an important marker, uh, you know, the amount of tissue available can be a, a limitation. So if you want to in sufficiently interrogate a mouse model, there are some critical characteristics of the platform that you're going to use. So let's talk about that here. Of course, we mentioned that there is relatively little sample available from the mouse. And so we want to make sure that the platform is able to provide a, as much data as possible with a small sample volume. We do need to make sure that the assay is quite sensitive because as we mentioned before, the early stages of a disease are the place where an intervention oftentimes is most effective. So to be able to identify those earliest stages uh, is quite important 
the results that you get need to be comprehensive. Uh, these days, the diseases that remain to be solved are often multifactorial, and the treatments, the efficacy of a treatment is measured not by a single single outcome, but the uh, sum total of a variety of, fa of factors. So it's important to be able to get all of those data with one platform. And of course, it's very important that the data is highly reproducible so that it is uh, convincing to the regulatory authorities. It would be helpful if all of this could be achieved with a cost-effective platform. And the, um, the XMAP platform, I think, uh, really effectively achieves all of these needs here. So we're going to take a little bit, uh, a brief look at how the XMAP platform works and how the assays are constructed. These are bead-based multiplex assays, similar to an ELISA in concept. Uh, the beads are fluorescently labeled, and each bead has a different spectral address, and two of these beads are conjugated capture antibodies. And so these are put into a 96-well plate or a 384-well plate. And uh, the first step is to simply dispense the beads. And these beads would have capture antibodies for all of the different analytes that one is interested in analyzing. And so those are put into the plate and washed two times. And at that point, sample is added. So when the sample contains the analytes that the capture antibodies on the beads recognizes, it will bind, the, the beads will bind to that analyte. And the rest of the unbound material is subsequently washed off with three wash steps. Afterwards, a biotinylated detection antibody specific for a different epitope on the same analyte is added. And this yields a sandwich immunoassay that's highly specific because it requires the simultaneous binding of two different antibodies in order to get a signal. So that um, detection antibody is biotinylated, which will then uh, enable our downstream detection of the uh, analyte quantity uh, using a streptavidin phycoerythrin marker. So streptavidin binds to the biotinylated detection antibodies, and the phycoerythrin is a fluorescent reporter dye, and the fluorescence output uh, is measured using a laser-based fluidic system, and each of the beads is individually analyzed, characterized, uh, referred to as sorted here, the, the fluorescent sorting determines which analyte is being measured, and the relative amount of phycoerythrin fluorescence uh, allows one to plot a standard curve uh, yielding a relative concentration measurement for that analyte in that sample. So when you perform an assay like this and you get this data, uh, it's also really important to consider the overall experiment that you're, that you're running here. So we, we just finished discussing how the platform works and that samples are added and you can get uh, a multiplex measurement of a variety of factors, oftentimes immune factors, cytokines, chemokines, growth factors, various things that you would want a com comprehensive picture within a, a single sample. And what we're gonna look at now is after acquiring that data, in order to analyze it properly, it's critical that the experiment was designed in a way that will facilitate that analysis. So I've got an example right here of a situation where age was a factor that was compared in the response to influenza infection in a mouse model. And while this is a relatively large age difference, the adult mice are 12 to 16 weeks of age versus the aged mice which are uh, 72 to 76 weeks of age, what we see here is the impact just of age in otherwise a well-controlled experiment where the strain of mouse is exactly the same, they were, uh, they were administered exactly the same strain of influenza virus, the timing was exactly the same. And what we see is that based on, simply based on age, there is a significant change in the rate of cytokine response. And for some cytokines, uh, a change in the magnitude of that response. And it goes both ways. What we see here is that in some cases, uh, for some inflammatory markers, you see a more rapid increase in uh, the response among the, the aged mice, for example, in TNF-alpha. In other cases, in IL-6, you simply see a uh, delayed response of the cytokine production in the older group of mice. And in all of these cases, and in many other cases that are in this publication, the differences between the two age groups were highly significant. 
So it's really important to, among other things, control for the age of the animals that you're using in your mouse experiments and to make sure that they accurately reflect the disease that you're studying. So in addition to age, let's take a little bit, uh, let's take a, a brief look at the impact of the different tissue that you might look at in, in the level of chemokines that you might be assessing. So these data that we're showing here are composite data from a panel of 33 chemokines uh, looking at all the, the, the levels of these chemokines across a variety of tissues from a mouse at two different age points. So the age difference in this case is not as great as, as that that we saw in the previous slide. Uh, we're looking at the difference between three-week-old mice and 10-month-old mice. And we're looking at a variety of tissues. Uh, on the low end, you can see in brain and in kidney, you have relatively low levels of these chemokines. And from an immunologic perspective, that's not surprising. Uh, these are tissues that are you know, not generally uh, attracting a significant response of uh, immune cells in healthy mice. Whereas in plasma, where you have most of the circulation of immune cells occurring, you see relatively higher levels. So it's critical that you're comparing uh, appropriate tissue or sample sources when trying to draw conclusions, and that those are selected based on the model that you're using. Now, in addition to the age differences that we saw in the last couple of slides, it's really important to just look at, at simply the tissue differences and that the correct tissue is chosen for the work that you're doing. Now, these are sort of bulk tissues here. We have uh, liver, kidney, intestine. In many experiments, it's critical to find even more, uh, more specific subregions of tissues to look at the impact of either the disease or the treatment. And so the consistency in sample extraction and preparation is really critical. And if it is just a small region of a tissue that is going to yield the results that you need, it's really important that there is good consistency in that sample acquisition. Now, shifting a little bit from the experimental design considerations, let's take a look at the key assay attributes that we need. So we looked previously at the platform and the characteristics of the platform that are really uh, important and impactful for successful mouse model research. The assay itself also plays a major role. And so looking at what we're looking at here on this slide is a standard curve from an XMAP based experiment. And this standard curve is what's used to determine the concentration of each of the analytes within a sample. And just to orient you to what we're seeing on the screen here, along the x-axis, uh, we have the concentration in picograms per mil. And along the y-axis, we have the fluorescence intensity. Remember, we spoke about the phycoerythrin reporter molecule that's uh, bound to the detection antibody. Uh, and that is the fluorescence of that is proportional to the quantity of the analyte present. And so that can be plotted with a standard curve using um, standard material at known concentrations to then yield, in this case, a, uh, an eight-point standard curve showing the concentrations of those standard curve points. Uh, those are the square, uh, square boxes along the curve. In parentheses, we see the percent recovery. And so those are, um, those are a percentage expression of how close the measured value of the standard curve point is to the expected value. And 100% and is ideal for that. Um, on the lower right corner, you see the, the acronym uh, LLOQ, and that is referring to the lower limit of quantitation. So within the range of the standard curve, that is the lowest concentration that can be detected. And in this case, uh, it's uh, a bit less than one picogram per mil. And in the upper left corner, we see the upper limit of quantitation. And so that shows the, the high end of the standard curve. And along the curve, you can see a series of green triangles, and those are the samples. And so looking at a standard curve like this, the key, what you're looking for in a standard curve is a large, large dynamic range, as well as excellent low end sensitivity. And those two things, uh, will then yield results and primarily quantitative results for most samples and enable the researcher to distinguish between healthy uh, samples, which oftentimes for these markers uh, have very low levels of expression versus diseased samples or treated samples, which can have much higher levels. And to have both the healthy and disease samples in range is quite important for a successful assay. Uh, 
when it's possible to get both the healthy and disease samples quantitatively measured within the same standard curve, the statistical analysis that's necessary downstream is much easier. Now, in addition to being able to uh, identify the concentration of all of your samples, another big benefit of a comprehensive assay is the ability to profile an entire signaling pathway. And so frequently, this technology is used for looking at cytokines and chemokines because the immune system functions through a variety of signaling molecules and messengers, and no one of them paints a clear picture of exactly what is happening. In addition to those uh, phosphoproteins, cell signaling cascades are, are quite important as well. And so on the left, we see uh, an example of the migration of immune cells through uh, the airway epithelium and the various uh, cytokines and signaling molecules that influence the cell migration. And all of those can be measured in a single well uh, with, the same, with, with, with one sample at the same time. And on the right, we see uh, the EGF signaling cascade and the various downstream mediators that are phosphoproteins that can be impacted uh, in that signaling cascade and an example of a pharmaceutical cetuximab that blocks that signaling and thus blocks downstream phosphorylation of that cascade. And using a multiplex platform like this, you can actually look at each of the phosphoproteins along those cascades uh, to determine exactly where the drug or treatment that you're administering has its impact. So in summary, with the key uh, assay attributes, it's really important that you are able to not only get accurate and comprehensive data from each individual sample, but that the throughput of samples is amenable to automation. I mean, these days it's important to have uh, many replicates of your model and to be able to analyze those data quite quickly. So the benefit of being able to look at data in both a 96 as well as a 384 well plate format uh, assists with sample throughput and being able to uh, use a variety of sample input types uh, and have compatible reagents as well as provide the data that would uh, provide data very quickly that would otherwise take a lot of time to acquire using a non-multiplex approach. And one other benefit uh, of doing these analysis in a multiplex format is that it greatly minimizes the variability. If, if each of the analytes was assayed independently, small variations in timing can impact the reproducibility of experiments, and that's effectively eliminated in this multiplex platform. So when you're considering multiplex assays, it's really important to make sure that the vendor that you're considering provides sufficient data to, to deter, for you to be able to determine that this assay will meet your experimental needs. Um, we discussed the lower and upper limits of quantitation when we we're looking at the standard curve and the working range, the broad dynamic range that's necessary. In addition to those, uh, another term that is frequently used is the limit of detection. And it's important to distinguish the limit of detection from the lower limit of quantitation. Limits of detection refer only to the variation of background and is typically de defined as two standard deviations above the background. And that's sufficient to determine that a sample is different from background, but it's not, su not sufficient to determine uh, whether what the actual concentration of that sample is. The inter and assay CV is another uh, really important characteristic as well as sample validation. So looking at the performance of the assay and determining that samples themselves can actually be measured accurately uh, with the assay is, is really another important feature as well. And these last two, linearity and parallelism, are further tests uh, to determine the robustness of the assay, essentially demonstrating that as a sample is further diluted, that it continues to provide the same results and that those results are the same uh, regardless of the sample type that is used. Now, stepping back a little bit, we have been focusing primarily on proteins. Looking at the, the multiplex assays for different proteins is critical. We know that uh, these signaling molecules are the primary drivers that are actually doing the work within cells. But when you step back, you look at uh, looking at the gene expression is 
typically what people have done in the past and what is still a very important thing to understand what genes are involved in various pathways. And then looking at the big picture of the organism, it's really the physiology that is driving us to investigate diseases. Uh, a disease is important to research when the impact is, determined, is, is seen through its physiologic impact. So protein levels fit squarely between these things. And it's important to recognize the value of looking at both the gene expression data as well as the physiologic data uh, in conjunction with protein levels. And so I wanna uh, provide you with a little bit of uh, information that may not be widely recognized here because it's been, um, historically there's been a lot of effort put on looking at gene expression levels for a lot of signaling molecules. And gene expression sometimes does practice uh, track well with protein levels, but not always. So let's take a look at an experiment uh, that involved looking at a mouse brain inflammation model and determining both using uh, a qPCR technique as well as Bioplex technology uh, whether the gene expression profiles matched protein levels. Using a 33plex mouse chemokine panel, um, the researchers looked at a variety of signaling molecules in the immune systems of these mice, and particularly in, in mouse brain inflammation, both with, uh, uh, with, with the protein levels as well as the gene expression, and determined that approximately three quarters, 73% of the analytes looked at, tracked similarly in uh, messenger RNA levels using the qPCR uh, versus protein levels, but a bit more than a quarter diverged significantly from uh, between the gene and protein levels. We can see that list right here. The, the chemokines in red tracked similarly between gene and protein, and those in black uh, were different. And so it's quite important to, to remember that RNA and that gene expression is not a proxy for protein expression. They're both important, and they can both provide different information, particularly when the information about regulation of gene transcription is important or the persistence of proteins is relevant, and in many disease states it is. So thank you very much for your attention with this. I'm gonna leave you with this last, last slide looking at a mouse model. And, uh, and now I'm open to taking any questions. Thank you, Dr. Braunschweig, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Answer a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, what is it about Luminex technology that enables such a higher degree of multiplexing than other technologies? Well, that's a good question. Yeah, we, we spoke a little bit about it earlier in the presentation uh, the colored beads, the fluorescent microspheres that underlie the Luminex technology. And the benefit of using these fluorescent microspheres is that up to 500 different spectral addresses can be determined with these, uh, with, the, with the dyeing within the microspheres. And therefore, you can have up to a 500 plex assay. And so when compared with technologies that involve spots on the bottom of a well or a, a ELISA or Western blotting, the throughput is dramatically higher because of the microspheres, their small size, their ability to be bound with different detection antibodies, different capture antibodies, and then ultimately different detection antibodies. So the plex level, because of the bead base of Luminex technology, is far superior to most other proteomics tools that are available today. Thank you. Next one is, how do you prepare tissues for XMAP assays? Oh, that, that is a good question. And uh, preparing tissues for XMAP assays, there isn't a single answer that, it, that solves that. And one, but one important guiding principle in it is that it's critical to determine a good tissue preparation strategy and then stick with that throughout all of one's experiments. Um, typically, uh, mild detergents would be used to disrupt tissues, but this can vary dramatically uh, based, on the, based on how easy it is to disrupt the tissue. And so, broadly speaking, um, using uh, what is often referred to as a RIPA buffer is a reasonable place to start. Uh, various vendors have lysis kits that are well-suited well for this technology. And so some amount of experimentation needs to occur prior to determining the optimal protocol for tissue preparation. 
but invariably this will involve uh, some amount of protease and phosphatase inhibition, uh, as well as solubilizing the proteins and if they are membrane-bound proteins to use appropriate detergents for that and generally to uh, keep the detergent concentration relatively low in order to not disrupt antibody binding during the assay. Okay, we have time for one more question. What would cause an analyte to not be detectable within an assay? Uh, yeah, so typically with a well-structured assay, the main reason for an analyte to not be detectable would simply be because the concentration of the analyte in the sample is too low, is below the lower limit of quantitation or the limit of detection that you're looking at. And so that can occur in many cases physiologically. Many of the analytes that are interesting to look at occur at very low concentrations in healthy individuals and are upregulated up, up massively in the case of disease. And so um, an analyte might not be detected in all healthy samples, and that's a pretty normal thing. In fact, that's something that is physiologically favorable because when you, have an, when you have an analyte that is capable of eliciting a really strong recruitment of immune cells or uh, leading to dramatic infection, it's really important that that analyte exists at uh, a negligible, if any, level during normal physiology. But in, so in cases where low levels are important to look at, as we mentioned before, for example, at the early stages in disease, it's really critical to have an assay whose lower limit of quantitation is as low as possible or is low enough to sufficiently detect the analytes that you're looking for. So again, when you're taking a look through commercial vendors for assays, it's really important to make sure you have information about the lower limit of quantitation and some understanding of what your uh, model, what you would predict that your model would have in terms of concentrations of those analytes to, to best guide you forward. Well, thank you again, Dr. Braunschweig. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Yeah, I, I really appreciate you uh, listening and uh, being engaged through this presentation and, and wish, wish you all the best in, uh, in the work that you're doing. Uh, ultimately, these mouse models are used to solve some of the most challenging diseases that afflict humans, and it's really quite important work. So I, I wish everybody listening uh, the greatest success with their efforts. Thank you. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions, questions we did not have time for today, and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. We would like to thank Dr. Braunschweig for his time today and his important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Luminex, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand through June of 2019. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.